So, um, from your discussions, um, you might have come up with all sorts of thoughts. And um, I've tried here to home in on real specifics, real specific building blocks that um, a, a child would need to learn to help them, in this case, with this evaluation of Dickens' description of London. Um, and so we've got here knowledge of similar description and its typical features, um, perhaps familiarity with archaic language, maybe you talked about that. Knowledge of how to write evaluation questions and any specific eva exam evaluations, oh sorry, sorry, exam requirements. Um, and of course those are important um, so that the child knows what's going to be required of them. Knowledge of the historical context. And of course, those much more basic underpinning building blocks that, that it's useful when they're already in place, like strong grasp of syntax, fag, etc., that, that will mean that child is going to be able to communicate effectively um, at whatever level it is that they're writing. And so there could be a whole range of other things that you, that you could have talked about at this stage, prior building blocks that, um, that would be identified and um, in advance and the teacher would be aware that a child has um, uh, reached the level they need to in these areas so that they can actually attempt this task successfully. Um, but of course um, those questions of what can be distinguished from questions of how it is that though that what is going to be delivered. And so in the yellow box we've got um, suggestions of, of, of activity types, class reading of the text, pair discussion of descriptive techniques, exercises to practice correct use of SPAG, for example. So all these um, are, are, are activity types rather than thinking about what. Now, why, why labour this point? Why perhaps artificially disentangle things which in, a, in, in teaching for the teacher aren't necessarily disentangled because they're so interconnected. Now there's a reason for that and it's because so often um, that it is the case that discussions around what would give a quality education for pupils can revolve around the yellow box, can revolve around questions of what we could call pedagogy, questions of how it is that the what is delivered. And of course actually um, a quality education involves much more than the questions of how. It also involves questions of what. And if we think about that, questions of what the building blocks are that a child would need to have had already established um, and know and be secure in to be able to move on. And also that sort of basic thing around um, uh, is that activity type appropriate for that specific teaching um, intention. No, what it was that you wanted to teach, okay, it might be a broad tick, we want you, uh, teachers to use those sorts of activity type, but was the very specifics of that activity type appropriate for teaching that very particular curricular goal in that context? Okay. So colleagues, I hope that you're, you're picking up now that what we're saying very clearly is the curriculum goes beyond what is assessed. It's absolutely clear that the curriculum should not be narrowed so that it only covers what teachers know will be assessed. Because we will not be giving our young people what they need as they move forward into secondary schools, beyond secondary schools, into higher education, further education, and, and into the job market. Um, just as an aside, um, as, as one or two of you uh, will know, um, I'm a linguist, and um, I, um, German was my, my main subject, and French was my subsidiary. Um, when I arrived in Austria many years ago for my year's intercalation from university, where you, you, um, you, go to, uh, you go abroad, for those of you who don't know, and really polish your language, I'd, um, I'd been the recipient by that time of nine years German teaching. Um, and um, I could have very competently discussed with you in German um, the cause of the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Um, I could have discussed with you the causes and solutions for unemployment in the Northwest. And I could have done that very confidently in German, because those were the sort of things we did in language sessions um, at university and prior to that at A-level. 
Unfortunately, on arriving in Austria and being there on my own for the first time without a, a pen friend or exchange partner, as we now call them, um, I was totally unable to open a bank account. I had no practical conversation whatsoever. Now, that may well be my fault. Perhaps I had forgotten it all, but then, of course, a question arises as to the degree to which it was seen as important alongside the examination syllabus. Earlier this year, you'll recall, there was a, a, a furore because the revised early learning goals um, in uh, mathematics um, were, were redesigned so they only assess number. But we need to remember the assessment is not the curriculum. Do you stop teaching shape in the early years foundation stage because there's no longer a formal assessment on it? I, I know that anyone here rooted in the early years foundation stage would at once be thinking no. The curriculum is what we want children to know and to be able to use. It's not just the product of the examination. It's not just the examination or assessment syllabus. So let's move on to um, Ofsted's, um, let's move on if you can. The click's not working for some reason. Thank you. To Ofsted's working definition of curriculum. Um, you've talked about the curriculum after carrying out research, both in schools and looking at published research, this is where we are with a working definition of curriculum. Intent, if you look at that first phrase, sits with senior leaders, subject leaders, key stage leaders, heads of early years foundation stage. What they intend will happen, what they intend children will be taught in their subject, in their phase. Implementation is about what subject leaders, phase leaders and teachers do in the classroom. How that intent translates. And all of you who have been inspected and that must be virtually everyone in the room, will already have had that sort of conversation since Officer's inception. Why are you doing what you're doing, and how does it pan out in the classroom? Finally, it's what we see in the pupils. It's what pupils have learned. I really don't want everyone to rush out of here and start giving TLRs for intense implementation and impact. I think we need to be really clear about that. You know, if you want to think in terms of intent, implementation and impact, then you might think about that in terms of phases in a primary school or a secondary school, subjects in a primary school or secondary school. What do you want the children to know and to be able to do? And it goes back to an extent to, to my example earlier, the two o'clock year nine German class, where actually the national curriculum is giving you the broad outline of where you're going to take children in MFL. It's not going to tell you what to do at two o'clock on a Friday afternoon when you've got 30 year nines who just can't wait for the bell to go at 3.20. Somewhere in the school, someone has to make those decisions about a programme of teaching that teaches young people the knowledge they need to have so they can build on that and develop the skills that they need to use. So to reiterate, the curriculum is not just a subject or qualification offer. It's not the same as teaching activities. The curriculum is what is taught. And just pausing there, I suppose, I'd, I'd just like you to, to hold in your, in your mind a, a conversation I had at the weekend um, with, with um, my wife, who is um, a, a teacher of a reception class. Um, you can imagine our Friday evenings. Um, <laughs> we, we had a debate about the verb that preceded the words national curriculum. In your school, do you follow the national curriculum or do you teach it? I'd just like you to hold that 
in your mind? I think it's a really interesting question. People have looked up as if there was something really important there, so I'll say it again. Do you follow the national curriculum in your school or do you teach the national curriculum? The curriculum is what is taught, not how it's taught. It isn't about devising extra and more elaborate or creative activities. The creative curriculum that we often talk about is actually discussing teaching activities. It's thinking about pedagogy. It's thinking about desired outcomes at times separate from what you actually need to teach to reach those desired outcomes. At a subject level, a good curriculum is going to be based on proactive thinking. And many of you will have been involved in that during the course of your career in the different posts that you've held. It'll be a product of a clear consideration of the sequence of contents necessary for children to make progress. That last sentence, colleagues, does not imply in any shape, sense or form that thematic teaching is right or wrong. It simply means that if you are going to use single subject teaching or thematic teaching, you need to consider the knowledge elements that children need to actually learn and be able to build upon. And there's a little bit there going back to my, do you follow the national curriculum or do you teach the national curriculum? And if, you, if, if you're involved in primary teaching, you may want to think about that when you think about what does science at key stage two look like? Have we taught the science curriculum through our themes? Have we taught the history curriculum through our themes? No inspector is going to turn up at your school <coughs> tomorrow or next September and say, right, let's talk about curriculum intent, okay? What they're going to do is ask very similar questions to the questions they ask now. As a leader in your institution, do you consider what children need to learn and the order to teach that in? Have you thought about that as a school, as a faculty, as a department, as a key stage? We're going to want to know when we actually move around the building with you whether the curriculum for each subject or phase is actually maximising the likelihood that children will remember and connect the steps they've been taught. And of course one of the things we're going to want to do as, as we walk around is, is learn how well the content outlined in the curriculum is being learned by children, how much they are able to use that knowledge and build on that knowledge. I think it's really important, colleagues, to, to be clear that the, the impact question is not a signal for more data collection. It's about the capacity of the school to actually demonstrate to parents, indeed to the children that go there, as well as to inspectors, what's going on. From our perspective, it's going to be, let's go to the classrooms, let's talk to children, let's look at their books, let's look at the sequence of lessons. It's not going to be, let's get the data out and spend three hours on that. Carl. Thank you. So I focus on curriculum content, on what our Chief Inspector called the substance of education. I, as you've heard, um, as well as Ofsted's own research, survey work, our inspection experience, <coughs> the work that we're doing um, towards the um, education inspection framework is also um, predicated on, on theoretical research. And what we know is there's significant research from the field of cognitive psychology, on the importance of systematic and cumulative knowledge acquisition for progress. And over um, the next session, we're going to talk about that acquisition of knowledge and progress and what this tells us about the nature of the curriculum. And while science um, may not claim to provide the final word on any issue, the research that we are referencing is the settled consensus of a field of research over many decades. 
and that's why it's important that we consider the findings from cognitive psychology. So let's just think for a moment about knowledge. Knowledge does more than just help students to hone their thinking. It makes learning easier. It's not only cumulative, but it grows exponentially. A rich base of knowledge helps learners to learn more. It's sticky, it's generative. It allows us to make those associations, that rich level of association. It allows us to, to, um, to bring concepts together, to bring ideas together, to see them in different areas, in different subjects, in different lights, which deepens that knowledge, which deepens that understanding. Consider when we're reading a text and the, the, how we're, with that rich knowledge base, it lessens the need to consciously search for those connections. So the learning is interrupted less frequently because we can see those associations, the things that are there. And also when we've, we've got a number of things that we need to deal with um, in terms of, let's say, our, our working memory, we might chunk that information down, which enables us to ma manipulate it in a better way. We can only do that um, uh, more efficiently if we're able to draw on that prior knowledge. But it's not just about being able to, um, uh, to make learning easier and, and to move forward like that. It also enhances cognitive uh, processes, such as reasoning and problem solving. You know, when we think about the memory, it's not just a repository for facts. It's the place where we've worked through problems, we've thought about the problems that we've looked at, we've maybe stored in there um, uh, what's occurred, we've teased out key ideas to understand them for ourselves and uh, it's a place where the conclusions that we've drawn from that sit and we draw on those things as we as we move through the curriculum think of it as a little bit like the knowledge rich get knowledge richer so when we think about knowledge and prior knowledge and its importance the substance of education has been talking well what does it mean to get better then at languages, at mathematics, at history, or English, or, or any other subject for that matter. The thing about progression from a, uh, a standard dictionary point of view, it's a series with a definite pattern of advance, a, a process of developing or moving gradually towards a more advanced state. So how do we work through that most efficiently, most effectively, able to, to take on what we need? And consider it from a subject level the selection of material, the content, how one sequences that, the what, as, as Heather and Bradley have referred to, and as, as, as practitioners, how one carefully considers, reviews, refines what needs to be known sequentially to get better, to make progress in the subject. I'm a historian um, by trade, and if I think about the, the work through uh, in terms of where a child might um, come across interpretation, say um, in year seven we might be looking at an individual, uh, was King John a bad king, that kind of, uh, 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 of enquiry question, and how that moves through we might consider interpretation in the way that Tudor portraiture is used uh, as people move on. We might consider empire as, as pupils move through the school and, and the changing nature of empire and how it's been um, viewed by different historians over time and, and through um, into uh, to, to GCSE and then into A-level we might get in terms of historiography and, and the, the, the change in views of, of historians. So, but what you can see there is dealing with the same thing but actually uh, that, that level of nuance, that layering of the knowledge, that ability to ex explore it, to go deeper, uh, to develop that understanding. The quote here summarises the way that learning is understood in cognitive psychology, that alteration in long-term memory. If nothing has altered in long-term memory, nothing has been learned. For, so in terms of knowledge, that, that change in what is known in memory, and this is a very broad definition of the word knowledge. And for us it encompasses know what, how you deepen that subject or that domain knowledge how you develop your understanding, your propensity for rational thought, your ability to be able to draw inferences, to think analytically. But, the, but alongside that, it's your know-how your, in terms of your skills, your learnt behaviours. So if we take something, for example, of, uh, as reading, so we take reading, for example, you've got your knowledge of vocabulary, your know-what, but that allows reading comprehension, your know-how. So you've got that link there. And in this sense, 
you can see the curriculum as the progression model, i.e. you make progress by knowing more and remembering more, which enables you to make those rich connections, to, um, uh, to deal with new and unfamiliar uh, subject content, to make um, more complex, uh, to have more complex ideas and, and wrestle with some of the, the, the thorny issues that are there to, to, get, um, to come towards you. So let's just move to activity four. We're going to test this out now. I want to apply this thinking, what we mean by knowledge and prior knowledge, to an actual real example. So in your book, you've got um, a lovely extract um, from Mountains of the Mind by Robert McFarlane. It's taken from a book written about mountains, how people have lived with mountains over time. Um, so, uh, I hope you're familiar with it. It's, um, it's written to inform and give pure reading pleasure through its reflections, beautiful descriptions, the humour that the author uses. And in this passage, the writer describes the mountaineers and polar explorers he's been researching from over 100 years ago. And what I'd like you to do is read through the passage. Think about the, the things that we've talked about. But what knowledge, and, and I'm asking you to approach this uh, as an adult, not as a, as a child. What, would you, what knowledge would you draw upon? through your school and through your adult life to help you understand, to comprehend this passage. So I'm going to give you four minutes uh, to, to go through and then a couple of minutes just to talk around your table. So six minutes in total. Off you go.